All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let's get this started. My name is Arturo Suarez. I am the uh, Cloud Product Manager at Canonical. Um, with me, we have Victor Estival, he's a Cloud Architect, uh, and Ikuo Kumagai, he works at um, Bidal, a Senior Engineer. If you guys want to get this presentation, have a look at it. I'm going to give you 10 seconds just to memorize the link here. It's actually going to be five seconds. So, uh, What are we going to do? What are we going to talk about? So one of the, of the questions we get whenever we get to a customer, someone that's, that wants to get into OpenStack, one of the first questions we get is, how performant is my cloud going to be? Am I going to be able to run this specific workload on it? Um, how much is it going to cost? Or uh, something of the nature like, can I get a cloud out of, out of a bunch of servers I have in my, in my uh, garage or whatever, right? We're going we're gonna to look at how we should build an OpenStack cloud and what we can get from a bunch of servers uh, from the sizing perspective, right? Sizing the cloud for, uh, for success, sizing the cloud um, to, uh, to attract workloads to make it uh, use. The more a cloud is used, the better it is, right? Before we get into that, and if this thing works, yes, let me tell you a little bit about my company, Canonical. This is the company behind Ubuntu. Ubuntu is the most popular OS in Linux desktop. It is also the most popular OS in the cloud. So over 60% of the uh, images that are spun up in uh, the three major public clouds. If they're Linux, 60% of them are going to be Ubuntu. And uh, as per the latest uh, OpenStack uh, survey, we also lead in uh, OpenStack, right? So Ubuntu underpins more OpenStack production deployments than the rest of the OS is combined. Let me get back here. All right, so how can we, uh, how do we underpin those, uh, those uh, deployments? There are several ways in which we are involved in those deployments, right? You can use the packages, you can use uh, the way we package it directly. You can use our tooling, which is the canonical OpenStack, or you can use our managed services, right? So that, the, late, the two uh, 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 later ones are the ones that, you know, we, when we go deploy that OpenStack for you, we do it the way we're going to explain um, here. So how we say, what are the attributes of a uh, cloud built for success? What does a cloud need to be in order to, uh, for it to be successful, right? Cloud needs to be reliable, meaning that it cannot fail, right? Uh, the workloads on top can fail. There has to be some high availability. has to be uh, some failover capabilities. We need to take care of that. And that has an impact in the sizing of the cloud. It has to be resilient. Basically, what I'm talking about here is you need to be able to upgrade your cloud with no pain, all right? Um, accommodate all the innovation that comes from OpenStack into a, uh, a, a process that can be something you can do. It needs to be scalable, right? Uh, the design needs to scale. Uh, it's one of the, of the premises of OpenStack. When you look at the mission of OpenStack, uh, it has to hyperscale. I don't know if that is thousands of tens of thousands of, of nodes, but it definitely has to scale, um, uh, and that has an impact on the design phase. It has to be flexible. I was talking about ac accommodating or attracting different workloads, right? It has to be flexible to make those workloads work efficiently in that very same cloud. And then um, money matters, right? So it also has to be economic. Um, I'm going to pass it to uh, my colleague here, Victor, who's going to struggle with this thing, uh, to talk about that reference architecture where we implement at uh, Canonical. So good afternoon. Um, our reference architecture trends to be HA by default because we believe if we are not providing HA on the management services, then our cloud is not reliable. We also believe that software-defined is mandatory. So we believe on software-defined storage and software-defined networking as a major drivers to get a successful cloud. So 
when we go to a customer, we always ask this question, what kind of workloads do we run? If you are go to a customer, if you are, go, if you are a customer, when you think on your OpenStack environment, can you tell me what kind of workloads do we are you going to run? Mostly no. So we try to design our architecture to be able to run any kind of workload, basically. So this is not working. Um, those are the design principles that we are following. Um, mainly, we want to be uh, scalable. That's our, our major concern. We already try and evaluate this technology in different kind of companies like the Deutsche Telekom, Time Warner, NEC, NTT. So it's a proven technology. Uh, has been a while since I started working with OpenStack, and this architecture has changed from the very beginning. We are going to cover that. Uh, we support a number of architectures. I don't know if you ever seen an architecture like that. This is a hyper-converged architecture. Our goal here is instead of having this traditional approach in which we have management node, compute node, a storage node, we just have building blocks. I'm a very fan of Lego, and we are basing this in the concept of Lego. So if I want to expand my cloud, I just need to add some more building blocks. As you can see here, we are providing a number of units of each service, three units of each service, to provide HA. So we have MySQL, Keystone, Horizon, Neutron, and a few others, and we are always deploying at least three units of each service. Every single node here will execute storage in the form of Fev and Swift. We'll execute Nova to provide compute capabilities, and we'll execute a bunch of OpenStack services. In this example, we are running five servers. If you want to add 100, 200, this architecture can scale up to that. For some of the customers, security is a very big concern. So they want to have these management services in one side, but they want to uh, combine a storage and compute. That's fine. We also support that. Some others are also trying to keep the traditional architecture, which is pretty much like this. In this case, we are having some storage nodes, some management nodes, some compute nodes. We have deployment running any of these architectures, but I, as I said, our recommended architecture is the first one. Have you ever seen this kind of architecture before? Yes? No? You can answer. I know it's weird, I know it's not very common, but I already have a bunch of customers running this architecture. At the very beginning, they were very concerned about that. How do I prevent a container to consume that many resources? What about the performance in theft? What about the overall performance on the cloud? When we go into this kind of architecture, one of the advantages we have is we don't have any bottleneck. So if I'm going with a traditional approach in which I have a number of management services. If I'm having uh, three manag uh, management services, servers, I can have one problem in any of them. Imagine that one of them is failing. What happened? At least I, I lose at least one unit of each service, which can be a problem. If I'm having here a problem, I will obviously lose a few units. And in terms of reliability, you will improve a lot. What others? Well, when I say here yours, it's because some of the customers are like, OK, I want to start with the, what we call full smooth, the first example I, I present. But after a while, I want to add some more servers. Do I need to span every time all the, all the um, OpenStack services across all these new nodes? No, you can have a mix of all of them. What about containers? I don't know if you realize, but most of the OpenStack services we deploy, we deploy them in containers, not in bare metal, not in VMs. What kind of containers do we use? We use Linux containers. Why? Because Linux containers provide a VM-like behavior, which means that I can deploy any stack I want, I can tweak anything that I need, but the footprint that I get in a container is much smaller than the one I get in, an, in a VM. If I think in a, in a VM, and I want to provide a new kernel for a new operating system, typically, the minimum amount of memory that I provide to this VM is one gigabyte, right? 
the average performance or the average footprint in terms of memory I get in a Linux container is between 33 and 110 megabytes. So the density I get is much better. Plus isolation. Uh, at the very beginning, when we did an OpenStack deployment, we tried to deploy all the OpenStack services on environmental. Well, we found that Cinder is not perfect. Glance can also have bugs. Some of the bugs may affect to your CPU, which can drive into 100% CPU consumption. In order to avoid these potential problems, if you are having a container, you are not having these kind of problems. Um, then drive us into the million dollar question for this kind of hyperbar converge or containers architecture. How do I prevent my containers to consume all the resources, right? Because what I said is I'm not having management, I'm not having compute, I'm not having storage, I'm having nodes. How do I prevent OpenStack services to get all the resources on my cloud? Well, by using C groups. I don't know how familiar are you with C groups or not, but let me tell you that C groups are wonderful. That's the best way I have to limit how much resources a process is consuming. I can limit the amount of CPU, I can limit the amount of memory, and I can limit everything that ha can happen on the container user space, which is wonderful. About sizing the cloud, if we start talking about sizing the cloud, one of the, 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 the things we need to know is hyper-threading, that's fine, but also overcommit, and we had a lot of problems with the overcommit radio. So by default, in OpenStack, the overcommit radio we have in terms of CPU is 16.1, which translates that I will have 16 virtual CPUs for one physical core. If my PMs are not executing a high demanding CPU workload, that's fine. But if I hit any kind of problem in these terms, all my CPU, all my VMs will collapse. And memory, um, OpenStack default memory over commit is 1.5, which translates in, uh, in I will have a viable 1.5 gigabyte of RAM per one physical gigabyte of RAM, which is not always very good. Theft. Um, how many of you are using Ceph for OpenStack deployments? A bunch, right? Uh, what I can tell you is all the deployments that I've been involved in the last two years are using Ceph. At the very beginning, the performance we had in Ceph was crap. Really, really bad. And that was one of the major concerns of the customer. It doesn't matter if I'm using compute, storage, and management, all of them separate, or I'm using these building blocks that we saw. Performance was really bad. So we start working very closely with Ink Tank in order to get a right approach to the theft sizing. And then self processor. Well, um, if you go to the Ceph website, they will tell you that you need one CPU, one core per OSD. What is that OSD? It's a daemon that is very related with every single disk that I'm having on, my, on the server. We run a bunch of tests and we found that if the processor is more powerful than the 2650v3, you can reserve 0 0.5 cores for each OSD. Then you are saving a bunch of resources. What about the memory? One gigabyte per terabyte. Can I have less? Yes, yeah, sure. But if you get any problem in any of the OSDs, you will need a lot of time to recover from this kind of uh, failure. This, as, much, as more this you get, the better performance. So we found that those customers running 12 disks per server are getting better performance than those one running only four or five disks per server. And what about Flask and NSD, as SSD? Well, we have a number of customers that said, I really need good performance on Ceph. So I will deploy all my Ceph nodes with SSD. The performance was not th that great. So, I, w I, will call, I, I will come back here later. Replicas. We recommend a number of three. Why? Well, we found that with only two replicas, the amount of time we need in order to recover any failure on the cluster is so, so high. And if we, if we go to four replicas, we need a very high bandwidth, more than eight gigabyte, gigabits, which is crazy. And the networking. If you want to run theft on top of one gigabyte NICs, then you're screwed you don't get any 
decent performance, so please, 10 gigabytes is the minimum. We're also working with a number of vendors, basically Intel and Mellanox, with a 40 gigabytes NICs, and the performance with 40 gigabytes is not as good as in a Sun, but it's getting closer and closer. So journal, is it worth to have an ethical journal? All the tests that we are executing so is that we get 12 times performance improvement when using journaling. So when you are sizing your cloud, please put at least one SSE per physical server because you will really find a very good improvement on your performance. I also leave here a real example with Ceph. Um, we had three replicas. We were using 23630B3 uh, processors. Uh, the journal will place into Intel P3770 700 disk. Uh, I'm putting this a specific disk because the performance that I got with this disk was amazing. We tried a bunch of them, just amazing. And the ultra star disk we picked here was because they were very cheap. So it's a good explanation. I also put all the conclusion here. What about the management nodes? Many people is asking, right, I don't want to go with the full smooth architecture. What I want is to have dedicated management nodes. So what kind of resources do I need to reserve for these management nodes? Well, remember that we have three units of each services for HA. Then you will need three services, uh, three ser servers, sorry, with at least four cores, 32 gigabytes of RAM, 500 gigabytes, and six NICs. In terms of CPU, what kind of CPU do I need? At least 2620B2 uh, to get a proper performance. However, if we want to build a high, um, a medium cloud, I would say up to 100 nodes, that's fine. If I want to go beyond these 100 nodes, I need to increase these resources. Um, by the way, when we are trying to build clouds with more than 200 physical nodes, we are hitting problems, mainly with RabbitMQ and database. So I don't know if you have any problem with that, but messaging is, has been a very, very pain in the ass. Right, so go down. What are the bottomless we're hiding? As I said, Robin and Q and MySQL are the major problems we're hitting. 200 physical nodes or 4,000 VMs. The question here is, how is the people creating the very big clouds like PayPal, eBay, and things like that? Well, mainly they are not using Neutron. That's one of the things that are, is, is allowing them to have this kind of clouds. Plus, they're having a bunch of regions within the same cloud. So they have several regions with a bunch of availability zones, but all of them are sharing a Keystone domain and a Horizon dashboard. So that's a trick. How to solve bottleneck? Well, uh, for the next release, Mitaka, we are going to support, finally, cells in production. We've been working with cells since a long, long time. The first time I hit cells was in Grizzly. They were very painful. I tried to work with cell in Juno and Kilo. They are not working properly yet. So we are putting a very big effort to make this work in uh, 1604 and Mitaka. And what is the, the new things about cells? We are just trying to work with the community to rewrite most of the code. So by default, we will release um, cell with, uh, which, uh, with any of our deployment, and then we can span the cell. Every cell will run their own messaging queue and their own uh, database service. Going down. Options. Well, this is just an example of the options that we usually drive to the customers. We have different approach. If the performance is what, you ma uh, what, is matters, what matters for you, then we will go with one one and the FTP over commit, 0 0.9 to 1 on memory, which is very, very conservative, but we found it's working really good. We are not using any kind of theme provisioning on theft, and we are keeping three replicas for theft. Hyper-threading, what's going on? Well, if the workload we are putting on top of your cloud is a database, you are not taking a lot of advantage of hyper-threading. If it's a web server or an application server, you get a very good improvement by using hyper-threading, so you get double number of BCPUs at the end. We also have the density one, which is the most aggressive. We are using hyper-threading, we are using 4 to 1 on CPU, 
1.2 on 1 in memory. We are using sim provisioning, but you cannot expect a very, you cannot expect a good performance on your cloud. And if it's not density and it's not performance, you get the balanced one. So you can either choose happy 3D yes or no. You get 2.2 to 1 on CPU, 1 1 on memory, which is kind of fair. And sim provisioning depending on the workloads you are planning to run. Our suggestion is always starting with sim provisioning yes. And if you have to disable, then you do that. We have a number of examples of configuration uh, that has been very successful for our customer. We found that in terms of cost, 26.7 TV3 is wonderful. You get 12 cores with a very nice amount of um, memory in, in, a very, uh, in a combination like this. We found, too, that if we go beyond 768 gigabytes of RAM on a single server, we, had, we hit a bottleneck in the communication between the memory and the processor. We are solving that in power, but um, uh, in the latest one, we, we hit some problem with that as well. Yep. Um, bottleneck when, when running servers with 1.5 terabytes of RAM. Uh, keep in mind that in this kind of deployment, we are also using a bunch of containers, which means that in a single server like this, we can run up to a million of containers. So you have a bunch of containers all the time hitting the processor and trying to hit the memory, then you are trying to squeeze the machine as much as you can. Million is a very high number for a single server. That is a number. Um, a Brief calculation about how much CPUs and how much memory can I have with balanced performance. And the density one. And now I leave Arturo to say, how can you get it started? Thanks. Um, so yes, this is um, this is how we do how we do things. Yes. All right. So this is how we do things. One of the of the of the ways in which we can uh, provide that service, the, the building of the cloud, the size and the designing of the cloud, is through Bootstack. It's our managed service. Uh, but the service we will build the cloud, we will operate it for you to an SLA, and we will hand it over whenever you guys are ready. Uh, the design phase is very interesting. It's basically what we've been doing, what uh, Victor has been explaining for your specific um, for your specific case. Uh, and again, the operation, uh, we take care of it for a, for a few months while you figure out how, what you want to do with OpenStack. This service is actually uh, MSP certified. So if you're, if you're worried about your uh, data protection, your security, your, um, your uh, uh, risk assessment, this is a third um, uh, party actually certifying us on our procedures as being uh, totally secured. Um, one of the companies here in Japan that is actually uh, selling this service uh, on our behalf or with us is Beetle. Beetle uh, here, Ikuo Kumagai, um, is going to show us some of the examples. He's going to focus specifically on the network part, which uh, we haven't covered uh, much, but he's going to give us some examples on how that converge or semi converged infrastructure is working for them. And he has some very interesting data to share with us. Ikuo. Yeah. I got my slide. Oh. Hi, I'm Iku Kumagai uh, from Bitoil. Uh, for those who don't know what we do, let me take a little bit about our company. We provide data center service in Japan, and we also provide cloud service and just started OpenStack hosted private cloud service based on canonical OpenStack. Today, I will be take, talking about our POC, that is open source hyperconverged infrastructure using 40 gig network. Just to let you know, this does not have anything to do with the private cloud service. So these are our needs for hyper-converged infrastructure. Structures as simple as possible, 
deploying as rapid as possible, integrated management, flexible scalability. So these days, a lot of vendors provide hyper-converged infrastructure product. But what I want is not a special server and product, which most of the time takes too long and uh, cost too much. So we want to build this infrastructure with uh, commodity servers. Yeah. Basic structure is almost the same as canonical one. The, the only one control no nodes, but uh, this is POC, just a POC. Yeah. <laughs> Computer storage server looks the same too, except we use PCIe SSD in safe cluster. And uh, about the network device, we adapted Melanox product to use 40 gig network. And for the deployment, we use Juju and Mass. We installed OS and set devices with the local charm. And for, develop, uh, and for deploying other OpenStack components, we picked from Charm Store. That here's the result of the, our POC. But this is what we tested. Firstly, we checked network performance between VM to VM in each physical node, and each physical node has 1 to 16 VM. So we've done this test in two types. One has VXLAN offload on, and the other one doesn't. Obviously, you can see that it is much bigger than with VXLAN offload on. The biggest result we get was when 8 VM interacted. That was 31.43 in total. As you see right here, sorry, as you see right here, when 16 VM interacted, the bandwidth decreased, decreased to 24.63. It might have been too dense for this time of spec. As you see, the bandwidth gradually goes down in a blaze. Secondly, we checked IOPS performance. We checked when one, two, or four VM in each four physical nodes interacted. In this test, we tried these four ways, sequential read, sequential write, uh, random read, and random write. This one on the above shows that above of the total and uh, at the bottom of the average. The result looks almost the same as the network performance test. Total IOPS increases as the number of VM increases, and the average decreases along the number of VM increases. So in total, when it leads, the highest goes up to 60,000 IOPS. And when it lights, it, it goes up to 30,000 IOPS. Depending on how you use this infra, it might meet your needs. Yeah. But still, we think we can use the 40 gigabit network more e effectively. To improve network performance, we are going to use DPDK so that it reduces network function cost of Linux curtain. 
and we are going to use safe RDMA for performance implement of safe I/O to enable direct. Oh, sorry. Sorry. To, sorry. <laughs> to enable direct memory access over Ethernet for storage cluster. Yes, it's, this is our best hyper-converged infrastructure for now. And I am looking forward to talk about the result next to, next test to you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. So very much. Um, just, to, just to wrap up before we go into, into to, questions. Yes. Um, Designing the cloud is uh, is is the the, the 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 part of the of the whole uh, process where you should be investing uh, most of your time, right? There's uh, going to be um, uh, already there are some clouds that are not uh, well designed and are starting to fail, right? And we had some news about some big vendor doing some public cloud at some point that uh, um, they are uh, pulling it off. Uh, because it was not properly designed, I guess, in the beginning. So please do design for the long term, right? You don't know what you're going to be running in that cloud uh, next year. It might be containers. It might be something new. It might be uh, so you don't know that. Uh, when you design your cloud, when you get your cloud, this is going to stay in your data center for 10 years, right? So take your time in doing that. We are uh, more than willing to help you out if you, uh, if you want. Keep the balance, right? Keep the right resource ratios that is also important and then choose your architecture wisely um, again the full smoosh or the or the hyper converged or the semi converged that has its uh, specific uh, um, uh, use cases okay for going to questions just a quick reminder tomorrow is the canonical track day starting at 9 a.m in uh Heian, uh with uh, mark shuttleworth keynote uh we have our booths S3, Vitalis, and S4, we're neighbors there. So just drop by if you have any questions, you want to go through any of the details, or contact us, Victor or myself, uh, anytime. Um, any questions you guys have for us? You can take them now. You sure? All right, let's wrap them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.